Hello, Internet. We are back with this episode number three. We're talking to uh, Stepno Deer. And he's a very fascinating fellow, ex-32 Battalion Ricky Wing. And then he went to CSI, Chief Staff Intelligence. But he can tell the story himself. And I think today we're going to hear a fascinating uh, talk about Tutu Carnival, I believe, also about Colonel Jan Breitendag. I don't need to introduce the Colonel to you. Step, can we go back one step? Can you um, tell us basically what happened to you up to now? And before you start, let me just say welcome here. Yeah. We're really grateful for your presence and your time. Good day, uh, all the viewers. Yes, just to summarize, uh, after the 3 2 recce wing um, operations, I joined CSI. There's Special Task uh, Directorate, and I went straight back into Angola. Uh, as I said, in 1983, we already infiltrated up to the Zaire-Zambia border. It's a place, area they call the Kazombu, and uh, we did some operations there. Uh, there was a tank threat. And uh, we managed to to stop the threat um, without any casualties. And um, then there was a battle at Kangamba. Uh, that operation was uh, called Operation Carton. And uh, the enemy kept on moving south. And uh, they actually... As I mentioned, UNITA's role was to control the area, the, most of the uh, eastern and southern Angola was controlled, the territory was controlled by uh, UNITA. So uh, FAPLA only occupied the towns and um, the, the major cities. So. This is where we end up now. That that was a quite a severe threat. The the um, because uh, Fapla couldn't go anywhere. Um, if they moved, they were ambushed. If they do patrols, they were killed. And they decided. from the central highlands of Angola, they, they will start um, doing an offensive operation, conventional uh, offensive attack on uh, where we are now, Twitu Kanabal. They were going to come from Menong straight through to Mavinga Airport. And then from there, they will attack Jamba, which was the... the the HQ or the town of Savimbi. Now, it was not possible, even though they tried many times, um, to fly from Menong, which is still about 200 kilometers to the west, to bomb uh, Jamba base. It was too far, the, the Mirage is no fighter. Uh, aircraft could maneuver down to Jamba and then return. So uh, that that was the objective, to move through Quito Carnival and then attack Mavinga. Now, since 1983, there's always been offensives. And, and you, you could calculate you would know exactly when the offensive will start because it depended on the rain, the weather. Remember the road conditions. You, you cannot maneuver off the road when it's rainy, you get stuck and all that. And then you are a target for UNITA. So that is what happened for about four or five years. And then in 19... 86, UNITA came, or oh, um, 
the FAP lock came up to here and they had about seven or eight brigades. And they were going to cross and then attack Mavinga. Now, uh, luckily, UNITA knew about this and they contacted through CSI, they requested help. So the chief of the defense force, General, I think it was General Geldnes, or could have been still constant, but anyhow, um, they then ordered two liaison teams from CSI, who would then infiltrate from Rundu and go and assess the situation here. Now, that happened in 1986. And then in 1987, the real um, battle started just south here at the Lomba River. It's about 20 kilometers south from Kwitukunaval. And there was quite um, big, severe fighting going on there with the help of UNITA. And then it was decided now that, uh, let me just first explain that at that stage, a 3-2 battalion was split into two groups, basically a mechanized group and then the old foot soldier infantry, you know, guerrilla type of, of um, battalion. So 3-2 became two battalions, and its strength was already about 2,000 in total. And then this meant that 3-2 had um, an anti-air facility with... Um, some of the rattles, um, they had eight, um, anti air machine guns. I think they called it the Easter Fark or something. And we also had the anti tank facility, the Z ZT3 rattles. Um, we had some mortars, 120 millimeter mortars mounted on the vehicles. So, it became quite a force, so there was a lot of rattles. And that was also the time when previously the commanders of 3-2 battalion were just lieutenant colonels or commandante. That was since Colonel Breitenbach, um, Commandant Gert Nel, uh, Commandant Dion Ferreira, and then with Commandant Eddie Fulhoun, he became promoted as a colonel, still serving in 3-2 battalion. So, yes, 3-2 uh, was involved at the Lombas, and then later on, uh, the next year, 6-1 um, mechanized uh, brigade became involved, and it was the two units were called uh, two zero uh, mech, mech brigade or whatever. And um, that is where they pushed back this forces. There was a 59 brigade and these two brigades, they were light infantry brigade. But this 59 was a specialized tank brigade, but put annihilated right here at Lomba completely. They, they lost everything. And there was a few elements that survived and they they then merged in with 59 brigade. And that's when we had this situation. So they went back, they were forced over by the bridge, and they took defensive positions here. Yeah. Now, I must just make one thing clear, and that is the aim of 
the operations at Quito Carnival. It was never the aim or objective to attack um, Quito Carnival. It, the aim was to, to halt and to reverse the FAPLA advance to uh, Mavinga and to Jamba. Now that was done during Operation Modular. Then in the second phase, when we pushed them back there already, uh, it was realized that they could still maneuver later. So they wanted to, to do as much um, casualties or damage for them so that they will not think about uh, attacking Mavinga again. So that operation's name was Operation Wupa. And that is where I became involved. And the last operation was uh, Operation Packer, where we, we forced the enemy across the, the Quito River. So yes, as I explained um, in the previous episode, my team, uh, which consisted of myself, uh, Mike Lovis Kochny and Andre Nell, we joined up with um, Commandant um, Les Ratman, who was the liaison, uh, chief liaison officer for UNITA. And then we, we got some special equipment, which I've never, never heard of or seen or whatever. <clears throat> and this equipment, or it, <laughs> it was actually a, a weapon, but a very powerful weapon. And it was called the ground shout. I will put a photo. And the ground shot was a Casper. As we know, a Casper, it's normal. It's got an open roof. And, you know, they all look the same. Some have got different um, weapons on it. But ours was closed. And you could get a bit claustrophobic in there. But it was closed because inside that roof, was 36 hundred watt more or less speakers in it. And as you walk in uh, on the left side, we open the door, there was four 900 watt state of the art, about half by half meter amplifiers. And they were state of the art. I, I don't, I think they could even take a bullet. So, then we also had a small tape recorder and a microphone and fitted on the back side of the door, there was a 5 kVA generator, you know, these petrol generators. And that was our weapon. Now, let me just come back to... <clears throat> The ground shot was developed by now General Lisa Ratman, and he started this project in 1986, first with a Unimog, and then the final product was um, in 1987-88, um, where it was used effectively. Now, firstly, the ground shot, the, it had many roles, but the main role, it was purely, purely psychological warfare. You know, we, we could rattle with anyone. You, you could speak to anyone. You just choose a target and you use it in that role. So we demoralized the enemy. Um, and I mean, so bad that they they couldn't sleep at night 
they were scared in the day they were tired. So we demoralized them completely. Also, it was used as a deception. And I will come later to this. Um, you know, instead of thinking that uh, attack is coming from there, you will uh, deceive them by making a noise in this direction. And uh, they will aim all their efforts up to this one um, threat, which is this ground shot. And then when they open their eyes, the attack is already from another direction. Okay, then lastly, we also used it for our own benefit because the, the troops, uh, which were mostly national servicemen, and uh, I must tell you, I, I take my hat off to those guys. They, they were really, they were good. But I'll come back to that later. Um, so, yes, um, Les was at the tactical, um, the brigade HQ, which was about 30 plus kilometers from we do more to this of east task. And I'm gonna before I talk about the our operation, let me just brief you on this uh, map. It's just a sketch, so it's not according to scale. But let's look at Quito Canaval and what there was on the ground. So firstly, this is the Quito River, and that is the Canaval. So this is the town, Quito Canaval. It has Easter, and then also on this side, is the road to Menong, where it almost from Menong site, also where the um, mirages, all the aircraft came from there because this airstrip uh, was damaged by our artillery. So it's almost 200 kilometers from Quito. So it made it a bit difficult for FAPLA. Um, to launch attack so far and they had to come back again. All right, then we had the 66th Brigade, the 16th Brigade, and the 13th Brigade. So that is three. The 8th Brigade was used just to, to secure the route uh, because you need the um, 3 2 Battalion and our Special Forces. We're doing guerrilla operations in this area, and they they disrupted the enemy, laid ambushes, and you know the typical they controlled that area like you need to with on this side. So it was very difficult. I think most of Eighth Brigade was also demolished or annihilated, and they later joined the. Uh, with 21 Brigade. So east of the river was the 21st Brigade, the 59th, which was a tank brigade, and the 25th. The 47th Brigade was taken out of action, and they, they never served any. They were taken off the roll as well. So in this area, we we had what we call the Shambinga. This is the Shambinga River, and that is the Shambinga high ground, which was a very strategic or a key point um, because we could control quite a lot from this high ground. And if you see this position there, uh, it's, that high point was an observation post for the 
forward observation officer. So this guy here, it was a South African. Uh, we have a photo of him, which I will uh, send to you. Where we this lieutenant here, he was a national serviceman. He sat here with some units. And then over the, at that high ground, we had um, our, uh, I think it was two, 205A a defense unit. Um, and they had a SAM-8, which was captured here during the operation in, in Lombard. So that basically was, uh, there was no, except for the UNITAS here, which was about two, two brigades that defended um, all the rest of our forces, our um, battle groups, which was basically two brigades uh, mechanized. Um, they were about 35 kilometers away or they were at the Brigade HQ. So, um, Fokla's artillery couldn't reach them there. Okay, then we, I started to deploy with my ground shot, and we came in here, and then during the night, uh, we would go, I think first we came in to about here, uh, then we started deploy at uh, about nine o'clock, ten in the evening, and uh, uh, then we put on a tape. It's still, still with uh, laser Ratman. Um, we put animal noises on hyenas and lions, and and then they. The guys couldn't sleep. It's just and elephants and everything. And then we put some weird heavy metal music on till three, four in the morning. So those guys couldn't sleep. Sometimes we had a a prisoner of war, which we caught here, and we we will let him speak to them and tell them, "Hey, you guys, <laughs> you are not." Uh, you know, bad things are going to happen to you. So, that, that worked. So, we, and then I, in the days, so the artillery couldn't uh, hit us. But, you know, it was tough. In the whole day, by the artillery, in the night, you have to go and work. So you know, then I was ordered, um, there was an attack coming. They were going to attack uh, 25 Brigade, I think. So the only route infil to infiltrate with the, the battle groups was through this Shambinga high ground. Now, if you know... Uh, conventional battles. If you go to Luatla where the battle school is, you see a convoy, a battle group is about three, four, 300 plus vehicles. And I'm talking armored, it is huge trucks, etc. You see that dust, you hear the noise uh, at least 12 plus kilometers away and the dust is the big thing uh, you you pick it up I, you even hear tremble on the ground when it comes to about two three kilometers so anyhow my task was then to move in through here there was a lot of minefields during the mod ops modular we lost uh, a veteran, which is a, a sawmill um, recovery vehicle. We lost it around about here. 
Africa and one tank. So we came, we passed there, and we put in, we dug in here a position. It was just behind the, the hill. So we had to dig in a manhole. Uh, so you can stand, but it's almost six feet. So when the artillery started firing, we just jumped into the holes. But also the, the, the Casper was a bit behind. So it, it wouldn't hit direct fire. So anyhow, we started putting, um, we had the tape recorder. We put this cassette in of the moving um, convoy. So we started with a soft volume and then you put up the volume, put up and about halfway, they started to hear us and they started shooting their artillery at us. So they aimed this up at us. In that time, we just put some more volume and then we jump into the um, man holes and by the time the battle groups came through here it was almost too late so they were already caught off hand and uh, you know now they had to move their weapons and their arcs of fire etc so yeah then they would not fire at us again and then we know the battle is on. So 25 Brigade was almost wiped out. But uh, I, I'm not going to give you the detail of how many, but in the end, we, we will look at the total and then we can decide who won or who was in favor. Um, okay, so after that, the battle groups returned, we remained here, yeah, and then we just continued with our um, uh, psychological warfare. And in the second, I think it was, yeah, this attack was by February 1987, 88. I think so. But two weeks later, we launched another attack here and we inflicted more damage. Right. The, because I said the aim was for Ops Hooper was to inflict ma maximum casualties and to let the FAPLA forces retreat across the river. Then on the Second attack, uh, we did quite a lot of uh, demoralizing. Uh, we would go up to one kilometer away from the trench in the night and then do all this, which we caught here. Yeah, after interrogation, we 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 heard that his their commander left for Luanda, and the reason he left was uh, that the reason he gave his troops was that um, he's going to sort out their pay problems and other problems, but uh, that was actually a lie. He he left because he was scared and he knew. They, they were going to get attacked. So we told them that. And we told them, listen, you know you are going to get attacked. You are going to die. That's why your commander is not here. He's lying to you. So get over the bridge and go. Because tomorrow we are coming. And that happened. Uh, we had the Reiki Special Forces right here at the bridge. There was a guy, I, I, he's a good friend of mine, Johnny de Govea. Uh, he died a few years ago. And he sat there and they 
his job was to count. And he said that night, hundreds, hundreds of them crossed the, the bridge. So, in that sense, we already won that. Because, again, the battle groups just moved in. We were then, we moved back behind the high ground. And there was no real resistance. The guys just, it, the battle took, I would say, not even one hour. And it was over. It was handed over to UNITA as what happened here. So now at the end, they only sat with 59 brigade. These, those who didn't uh, flee across the bridge, they joined the 59 brigade. Now, now we sat with, remember, it's a tank brigade. They were specialized. They had many Cubans with them and the Russians. I think there was about 66 Russians. And uh, yes, so, and also the fact that 59 Brigade was already involved in the first attack with 47 Brigade at the Lomba. So they were experienced and they already knew the South African tactics and their uh, way of warfare. So the final objective then was 59 Brigade and basically we knew it's, it was going to be a hard battle. So we prepared for that. Um, the, our troops, the national servicemen, I think I was also pulled back to the Brigade HQ for the preparation. And then the troops came to me and they asked, oh, you know, can't we... Can't we just play some music when we go in there? And uh, old Les said, the power of love that, I don't know who, uh, you'll probably know who sang that, but it's a... Uh, Jennifer uh, Rush. Yeah, that's right, Jennifer yeah. Rush. So when Les put that on, the troops loved it, and they came, they asked, look, can we not put that uh, Apocalypse Now um, soundtrack on? I said, but we don't have it here. This is not a disco. And one of the troops came, let's, let's play it, just to get the, the morale right. So uh, we had a... a a bless box. Uh, it's a basically a soft skin Casper, which is like a truck. It's not a troop carrier like the Casper, and it's also not armored. So on that we had a 81 millimeter mortar, and that was our fighting vehicle. So we left the the ground shot Casper here. And we came in with the attack. We came past here. Yeah, we were we were going to hit them frontly. But then unfortunately we came in by the side and they started to attack. The guys didn't just maneuver it. And and I must tell you one thing. Maybe I've been in the war for many years, but by that time. 1988, I was already 10 years of experience and I've never <laughs> seen such battles. I, I was completely lost. You know, it's not the way we fought guerrillas and special forces. This is war. It's conventional. There's so much. You, you don't know what's going on. So you just follow. And I followed uh, this. And they they broke through and they attacked. Um, and after, so 
we were right at the back of the the battle group, so you could see what's happening on uh, in the front. And um, when that was over, I mean, we dismounted, and I saw Les just going to the trenches, making drawings and taking details and pictures. So he sort of, the whole um, uh, doctrine of the FAPLAS, he, he memorized or put it onto paper and it was later used by the senior staff of forces, etc. So he did a great job there. He was a, one event that took place, I think it was just before 59 Brigade, before this attack, I was going to deploy here that night. And as I came down here at the Kambuga High Ground, I had a, I forgot to mention, uh, with me was um, a bottle which we called the EO or EW rattle. It's it is electronic warfare. It's all these different radios on different channels, and there was I think two or three Spanish guys. They were national servicemen, and in about three Portuguese guys and one local Unita who could speak the, the local and Bundu language. So what they would do is when we do ground shouting, they could listen in to what, what the enemy was saying. So um, anyhow, as I came down, the the guys, uh, there was a sergeant uh, who was in charge of them. And he stopped me and he, I said, what's wrong now? He says, no, he's, uh, his major wants to speak to me on the radio. And uh, I went to him and he, he said, he said, ask me, where are you? I said, I'm just south down some bingo. High ground. He tells me, uh, no, you can't be. I said, yes, I am. How are you? Who are you to tell me where I am? I know where I am. I said, but what's, what's it got to do with you anyhow? No, I'm going to stop right there. And he asked me, do you know where Johan Lehmann is? And with the same eight. I said, yeah. We just passed him about three, four hundred meters back. I said, but why? What? No, no, I must go to Johan and tell him we must leave. Uh, we must go come back to this area. So I, I said to him, you know, uh, sorry, but I'm not following, uh, you are not my commander. Will you please call Les Ratman on the radio and let him instruct me. I'm not following your orders. He said, no, but I must listen to him. Les is sleeping or whatever, and I have to go and get him and we must um, uh, retreat. And My Casper, we moved along the hill, and the next moment the shots, and I just shouted, and I knew it was the guys from from the anti air because they had a platoon from uh, from three two. I think the guy was uh, Felier de Foss. He was there with you on the month. So 
they killed two of my units and I just shouted, cease fire, cease fire. They realized, okay. And I went there. They were all sleeping under a top next to their rattle or, and Casper. So it looked like a nice picnic there. And I woke them up and I said, guys, you must leave. Yeah, but nah, tomorrow, tomorrow. So I sat there, waited till the early first light. And I chased them. I said, we must leave. We must leave. And uh, in the end, the, the, the Sam 8 had a lot of problems. Uh, you know, it's an armored vehicle, but it was not designed for the bush. It, it looked like these naughty cars, you know. Um, so when we started off, I think not even a few kilometers, we got stuck and then stuck again. And, uh, my corporal, uh, um, uh, he was from infantry school, corporal the two, he, uh, every time we had to take out the tow bar of, of the Casper and then pull him and then unloosen and by the second time I told him Corporal, whoop that that Sam and let's just go. Now we're just going to tow him. Uh, no use of, you know, every 10 minutes stopping and that. So we towed him up to a safe place. I think round about here there was all these different areas where, where there's bush. Uh, we be lay low during the day so by now it was around a bit of mickey we took in we hide into these bushes and there was a lot of man also it wasn't necessary to dig because everyone passed there it was like a stay over place and I went to Johan Lehmann and I told him, look, I don't like what happened last night. I'm going to, you and I better go see um, Les Ratman. And on the way, we, uh, I don't think we were away half an hour. The mix came in and they attacked our guys. Uh, um, Mike, Mike and Andre were in the open. They were under our Psalm 100. And uh, they told me there was about 20 plus sorties by the MiG 23s. And they killed my driver. They killed the sergeant uh, of the EO Rattle, plus another three of those interpreters. So they almost wiped out the whole of the EO. Rattle. And uh, yeah, when I arrived there by by um, Les at the Brigade HQ, I never, I, I didn't know this was happening. And uh, just that's when Les informed me, you know, your whole group is wiped out. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was a sad day. Um, but it happened, and the last, we we didn't use the EO throttle anymore, so we came back for the final attack on what happened at Kukwitu Carnival. And if we look at the, the strength of the two forces, uh, Fapla had 11,400 soldiers, and that is only this side. If you look at, at brigade, is about two, three thousand. So there alone is about uh, nine thousand. On this side, there was close to fifteen plus, and I know uh, a lot of Cubans also came in. They were. 15,000 Cubans in this area. So there was 
3,000 advisors, Russians, Cubans, um, East Germans, that 80 tanks, mostly T-54, 55s, a lot of artillery, the D-90s and all that. And then obviously the Air Force, which flew from Menon, who supported. So a lot of um, um, mix and helicopters, etc. So if we look at their losses, there was just over 4,000, 4,085 were killed. 194 armored personnel carriers were um, destroyed. And of those, there were 62 tanks. So they wiped out three quarters of the tanks. Uh, 92 artillery pieces were destroyed. Nine mix shot down and nine helicopters. So I reckon uh, if you sit with these figures, then don't tell me you won the battle. Uh, if we look at our side, the South African Defense Force and UNITA, we had 3,000 soldiers, a maximum. In the end, it was only 2,000. We had plus or minus 5,000 meters, 13 tanks. The tanks only came in during the last phase. We had the ZT3s, which is part of uh, the UNITA, uh, the, the 3 to mechanized um, battalion, and also 6 1 MAC. Mac. We had G5s, G6s, and then the 120 millimeter um, rocket launchers. Our Air Force was uh, almost non existent because uh, the enemy had is superiority. And, you know, you, you don't. Uh, The Mirage can't, cannot fight a MiG-12. So two of our Mirages, although they lost nine MiGs. But uh, our losses was from UNITA side plus or minus 3,000. We lost uh, 47 uh, Defense Force members. We lost three tanks, five rattles, and five other vehicles. Um, and one boss bock. Boss bock is like a, a spotter aircraft. So yes, that that is the situation. Um, I just want to come back to the aim of the objective, and it was not to take over Kwetukanaval. It was to prevent attack and further advances to Mavinga. Um, as you know, uh, UNITA was supported by the US. And there was a, a US-SA agreement, which I'm going to read to you now. And uh, if I say agreement, then it's not like the other people say, angerment. It's not the angerment. It's an agri. We were not getting angry, you know. And the first one was to, they agreed that they will prevent Swapu from governing Namibia. Okay, that didn't happen. Number two, the legitimacy to UNITA as a credible alternative to MPLA. That is what we tried to do. Although in 1982, that 92, that didn't happen. Okay. 
The third agreement was to link the independence of Namibia to the withdrawal of the Cuban forces because uh, the Cubans were a real threat to, to peace in the area. The last agreement was to weaken politically, economically, and socially the frontline states. Now, what was the frontline states? That is all the states on the of southern Africa, basically, that borders um, uh, South Africa. So if you look at uh, Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, we were quite friendly with Botswana, but Botswana wasn't a real threat. But uh, yes, that, that was the agreement. And you can look it up all over. You can read about all the the documents about the war we do there's a lot of people with different stories but in the end the history and the figures the facts they they will conclude who, who actually won and uh, we never wanted to to take we took an evolve however after Quito, the, the Cubans had a, a massive, massive offensive from the west where they came from, Kahama, and they went to the Kaluek Dam, and that is where 3 2 and 6 1 they withdrew from Quito, and the new war started there. So that happened the late 1980s or 89. So yes, um, we that that became a real threat, and they the Cubans they even crossed our border at, at uh, Namibia or Bomberland. So. Uh, yeah, I was not involved, so I don't have all the details. Um, then later on, I I returned then to Saint Michel. Um, my my team as well, and uh, my base was at Fort Kasinga, and I was just uh, you know the colonel called me and he would say, listen, uh, get all of those Bushmans at <clears throat> Fort Doppis. Fort Doppis was then just almost like a ghost-based uh, uh, base. There was not a lot of training going on. Uh, uh, Dapmaritz was the RSM there. And then we started doing anti-poaching uh, patrols in between in the Caprivi strip between Angola and Botswana. So DAP would have a, a section and they will go north to Angola and my section will move south. So they just did patrols there. There was a lot of poaching. Uh, they killed a lot of elephant and then Cut the ivory. So um, yeah, that that was that was a passion of uh, Colonel Breitenbach, and uh, I will uh, speak more about that in a later episode. So yes, that kept me busy for a while. Um, and. Then um, on round about September, the colonel <coughs> um, arranged for a Saint Michel day. Now, as you know, the Saint Michel <coughs> is the the angel of the paratroopers and uh, or the guardian, whatever. So. 
we then add those Turbo Dakotas and um, a lot of guests came and a few Rekis, old Rekis and uh, guys from 3-2 and Les Ratman also came and then we, we jumped on that Saturday <clears throat> on Saint Michel. It was quite nice, but I'll talk later about this because <laughs> some people were very annoyed. But anyhow, um, and then Colonel uh, Breitenbach was then going to uh, on pension by the end of that year. He already had a his um, second in command was Commandant Bert Sachs. So we already knew that Commandant Bert Sachs was going to take over. And, you know, as a, a new commander, it's like a new broom. You want to sweep. And then if there's dirt, you sweep the dirt out. And he got rid of a few. And he came to me and he, he said to me, look, you know, if I'm the, the OC here, I can hire and fire who I want. So I told him, oh, that's very nice, sir, you know. Then uh, I already knew he didn't like me, so I, I prepared. Uh, I already looked for options, but the the problem is he couldn't he couldn't fire me or transfer me because he was a South African infantry corps and I was with military corps, the military intelligence corps. So only a guy from military intelligence could transfer me. So I, anyhow, I just I left to South Africa and I got old of um, Dr. Vernon joined and he pulled me in and he said, come work for me. And we started developing um, a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun for in a two-man or mobile role. So um, that, that was specifically for use by the Renama. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we first had to, we identified the Ulicon as the perfect we weapon, but the, there was a lot of development that had to be done. So first we went to uh, Cape Town, to the Navy. They were the only ones who had these Ulicons, and they were very old and outdated. They had them. Um, there by Sea Point, um, uh, Simonstown, that area. So they were there in bunkers. So we went there and we did some training on it. And with me was uh, Dr. Uh, Joints. Uh, engineer. Uh, anyhow, we flew in. We ordered four of these guns, these cannons. When they arrived, uh, we started with the platform, a light, you know, maneuverable platform, and the ammunition was going to be developed by SWAT clip or whatever in Potsch of Sturm. So, they did that uh, it was quite a long time, and one Friday, I was sitting in a bar in Centurion with Rocky, my friend, and uh, I got a call. The barman said, look, who's Steph Nodia? I said, yes, it's me. And he said, there's a call for you. And it was a brigadier, he said. Steph, you must go back to Sir Michel. I said, Brigadier, how do you know I'm here? I'm sitting here in this bar. 
said, Steph, don't worry. I'm telling you, go back. I said, no, Brigitte. She said, why not? I said, because that man said he can fire me, and now you want me to go back. He fired me. He said, oh, Steph, just stop your nonsense and go and sort it out with him. <laughs> so I went back to Saint Michel, and yeah, it was not too bad. Uh, I had almost a red carpet treatment there at Saint Michel in NF eighty nine. We were going to withdraw anyhow, and everyone was just uh, preparing for the withdrawal. Now, as we know, that UN Resolution 435, we had to pull out and all that, and there will be uh, uh, elections in 1990. So we had choices. We could have stayed and then joined the Namibian Defense Force. But uh, intelligence I, I go back to HQ so uh, a lot to to support you need to so most of the stuff instead of taking them down across Poland border and, and donated it to to uh, UNITA uh, then at one stage I was called to um to Rundu, where CSI's um, our Rundu branch of special task was there with Colonel Fred Ulsich. And uh, I was told uh, that we're going to use our turbo decks and do some um, air supply drops, ammunition. So these turbo decks, we we rigged them with rails and um, static line cables inside, and they they could carry about three tons um, on average. So when I arrived there, uh, he was then Commandant Wouter uh, Hijo. He was my um, parachute instructor in 1980. So we came a long way. And uh, he, he said to me, Steph, we're going to make you a, a dispatcher on uh, the air supply. And there's a, this warrant officer, very nice guy, and he trained us. And, uh, well, then for about two weeks, we were just load. But we will fly in and drop. So, but on the first night, <laughs> there was also a, a major, I think. He was with the far finders and uh, he was number one and I was number two. So, as we can, you know, it's uh, like a, the LZ or dropping zone actually was marked by um, fire that was in a coffee tin with uh, some sand and petrol and diesel mixed. So they put this on this dropping zone every 20 meters apart, but you can see it quite from far. And that then is your dropping zone. And as we came in, uh, the next moment, I just saw trace of bullets, and they were shooting at us with the 14-5, and I shouted, and the number one, almost when the, the, the deck pulled away from the fire, the guy almost <laughs> left, <laughs> and I grabbed him, <clears throat> got him inside, and we decided, no, we're going to whatever, we're just going to drop this load and then get out of there. So, uh, yeah, that, that was it. And uh, landed the next morning. 
I went straight to the ink guys and I said, hey, find out who was that bastard that was shooting at us. And uh, that night, we were going to drop there again, and I fixed uh, what we call the carpenter special. It's three, three grenades like that, phosphor, and then you take this binding wire and you fasten it, and then before before you use it, you pull pull the pins, but the the lever won't go because they are kept by the wire. So I had that ready. And before, when we came in, round about the place where we got the fire, I just pushed the phosphorus out and I said, there's a present for you from yesterday. So uh, we dropped the rest of the guy. After this, we... There wasn't really much going on. I, I left for CSI. I worked in the headquarters. Uh, I was then called by Directorate of Foreign Relations. Uh, these are the guys who place the military attaches all over the world. And... Um, but they also had a special unit uh, where we worked with friendly uh, neighbor countries. For example, Lesotho and um, Swaziland. And because things changed then, uh, Mozambique became a friendly and we, we started to, to cooperate and support these countries. So uh, we were called the, uh, I'll come to the name later, but anyhow. So that was our role. Um, it was nice because for me to sit in, a, in an office, like a cockroach, you, you just run up and down the passages and sit on the chair the whole day. That that would have made me crazy. So, uh, yes, at least I had an opportunity to visit neighboring countries. And uh, my uh, officer in charge was a senior colonel, um, M.S. de Tui. And uh, he he was also he was due to be promoted to brigadier, and he became the officer commanding of the uh, eighth division. So when he left, I took over that post, but I was still then under um, uh, Colonel Dalpol and that. So, but we we really worked. very well as a team. Um, many of my projects I have to, to end due to politics and that, and I would just write back my funds. You know, if I had uh, a budget of 8 million, I wrote off almost half of that because I was not using the money. So uh, for that, we were opening missions, in uh, in Russia, so all the polit politics changed completely. So um, yeah, that was one thing we had to get used to. Uh, then I also did my um, junior staff courses. I finished that, and I did my uh, advanced military course. So I had to I had time then to catch up with the academic side. And then uh, you know, basically that is, I'm not going to talk uh, much further, but yeah, I, I got married um, after almost 14 years in the bush, I found somebody 
and uh, yes, I got married, and it happened on on Colonel uh, Henny Blows. He had a small holding there. Got married there, and then I started the family. So, of course, uh, I don't know if you guys. I would like to stop here because in the next episode, it's gonna be about Colonel Breitenbach. And then we will come back after that. The last will be on my time in South Africa, what happened there and how it affected my life, my career and everything. Um, so, yes, if you don't mind, and thank you for listening. If there's any questions, you can ask. I hope not too much. I have actually a few questions uh, here for you. Uh, not not too many, not too many. You know, we've been asked quite a few times. People ask me, how good was UNITA as a fighting force? How, how good were they? Well, to be honest, in the beginning, they were not good. They they were sporadic guys. When we saw them uh, during our attack on uh, Savati, we passed through um, a village where there was Unitas. And I, I promise you, there's a word we call in, in uh, Afrikaans. Uh, it's called flentergat. It's like a rag, rag tag, you know. And uh, you would see three soldiers, one, and none of them would have boots on. One will be uh, he will carry the AK, the other one will carry a magazine, and the other one will carry uh, another magazine. So that is how they were. But that was 19 early 80s, when we got involved with them, they improved quite a lot because remember that by now they got proper uh, uniform, they got weapons that was given by the CIA. Uh, all these weapons came from Zaire. Um, yes, they, you know, if, if I tell you it, um, if I was told you must go and fight for free, you're not getting paid, you will fight. Uh, the only thing they pay or give you was the food. What do you have to get for yourself? But uh, they were fighting for food because that was their pay. Um, and, and up till the day uh, the war ended, Unita was never paid, not even Savimbi, although they had some money that they made later on. But uh, no, I must say, I must tell you in all honesty, uh, they were just, they were better than Fapla. And they were fighting for with their hearts, not, uh, and they were fighting for the more democracy for a better goal life. And uh, we, with the training, remember they were first a guerrilla type of uh, force. Later on, they became more conventional. Um, so they, they improved. Um, you know, it, it, it takes a bit, if you're just a guerrilla, you, you don't know anything about tanks and artillery. You just, you have your small support weapon. So as things grew on, they, they later had um, their own tank battery. And it was situated in, in uh, Jamba. And, you know, those tanks came from Because in the one last battle, we took the brigade. So they were just sent to, to Jamba. 
and they got trained. Uh, probably it was Poplar that were operating on those tanks that were caught, and they were they joined UNITA then. So yes, they the ones I worked with, the special units I worked with, uh, the butt groups, they were very good. I can tell you that. Were there any Swapu cadres in the uh, Kyoto Carnival, or was this outright uh, FAPLA uh, versus UNITA and Genova forces? Yes, there was. Confirmed, there was. Everyone was there. The East uh, East Germans, um, there was even Frelimo guys from Mozambique. And that I know personally because I met the guys uh, in Mozambique. Um, they came down with Cubans and they even gave me their brigade, whatever. And they came and they fought from Frelimu, from all over they, they came. Now, how will you write the Cubans? Well, to be honest, they 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 can be. Uh, I remember one of the last attacks uh, that we were listening into them, and they was they they started shouting at the the Fapla troops, and we what we could make up. They were already in the convoy. They were busy to leave for Manong. So they were st standing there and the Foplers were in their trucks and apparently the, the interpreter told me, he says, hey, here's this Cuban, he's shouting, shouting, and he says, hey, hurry up, we must go, we must go. And, uh, yeah, they, they were revving those trucks like Alfa Romeo's <laughs> sport cars. They would just want to get out. But, you know, I, I must tell you one thing. In, in 1994, I, I returned to uh, Angola and civilian. And at Anjiva, I met a Cuban. And he said to me, hey, I know you. I said, how can you know me? He says, no, I know. I know where you were and what, what. I said, he says, hey, but we want, we must be friends. I said, yeah, no, but I don't, I don't speak Spanish, but you can make up something. It's quite close to Portuguese. So, yeah, we, we sort of became friends and he spoke to me about the war and all those things. And, uh, yeah, you know, I just left it there. But the thing is, they're very pacifist. Uh, they they're not that aggressive. They um, they like their culture, and uh, I think the only the biggest aggressor of of the Cubans were Fidel Castro himself, because he he even the the general of the Cubans who was involved during Quito, the battle. He was um, charged and he was killed uh, by a firing squad on orders from Fidel Castro. So, yeah, that tells everything. Yeah, that is one of my arguments too. Whenever these liberals come and tell me that the South Africans got defeated by Quito, I have to say it's very weird very weird indeed that you execute your own damn commander for winning. But then they, then they get obnoxious and normally that's where the club tuning corps starts so they can wake up. Uh, but I need to ask you something. I'm very interested because I'm from the police, of course, that you were using the Casper and the Blessbock. Now, the Blessbock is armored at the front, but the buck at the back is not. He's not armored. That's what you meant. I just want to explain to people here. But that was a yes. damn good vehicle. I mean, it was a great vehicle, but it had a problem in that it's uh, when you're going to four wheel drive, it goes into low range, <clears throat> and their low range is very low, very, very low range. Yeah. You have speed. 
So when you guys were towing this uh, Sam 8 out, I suppose you did go into low range to, to keep a pulling power, or, or can't you not remember uh, that far back? No, I can't. We, we were pulling 20, 30 kilometers an hour, so we we didn't uh, lose that much uh, momentum from the rest of the convoy. Because remember, we had the rattle in the front, and you know, although the rattle is it's much more powerful, but uh, it's got that automatic gearbox. You know, it's not like uh, the 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 Casper had a a manual gearbox, and it was strong. Yeah, I'm thoroughly enjoying that answer now. I can see the six one big guys now grinding their teeth, but that's fine. We can live with it. And I'm glad you said to me also that you uh, did play music on it because I was about to ask if you guys <laughs> ever had like a disco when you felt. Um, but I'm glad that, that you did play the Jennifer Rush. I, I liked her song very much. I mean, that woman had like a powerful voice, man. We can't play yeah. the song for you because, you know, YouTube will, will do something to us. But I think our generation, we remember that. Then I have two questions for you before you go. Um, early con 20 millimeter is quite damn heavy, especially if it comes from the Navy, um, because it stands on a little stupid, it's not a tripod, it looks like a round thing, it stands, I don't even know what you call it. Yeah. Um, so you, I, I suppose you guys would have sort of put wheels on it so you can tow it around or something, even with a donkey, or, or how did you work that out? And its ammo, of course, is bloody heavy as we well. Yes, we had a, a, a complete frame bolt with the mounting, and that would rotate. You, you sit in a, uh, in a small chair, and you would rotate with your feet, and then you will shoot with, with the hands. But it was operated by two men. Um, the frame was mostly aluminium or alloys, and... The, the wheels were very light, and we even had a carbon uh, fire, a fiber, uh, carbon, whatever, with Kevlar in the front. So it was sort of uh, armor plate. Two people, you know, tow it or pull it. Okay, so so it looks something like the uh, Z223, uh, where you spin in a circle, or well, not as heavy. Yeah, but just smaller, um, smaller scale. But the, it it was also armored piercing. Uh, that's why Swartlip developed the projectile and the the load or the charge for that, so it could be armor pierced, like the same as the 23 mil. This year, and you yeah. you can speak to Peter Williams. He, when we finished with it, uh, we took it up to him, and uh, they did the test there with Willem Ratta and everyone. They even had these model aircraft flying, and they would shoot at the, the aircraft. So yes, anyhow, he knows more about that the, the practical side. No, we'll definitely grab it. Um, we'll definitely grab it. But now I, I'm at the last question. Yeah, and you mentioned something about uh, the Saint Michel uh, parachute jump of the day, and you said that you will talk about it later uh, because there were some words or something happened there. Do you care to tell us about that incident? Uh, yes, <clears throat> I will repeat it again later, but. Uh... What happened, uh, we, uh, the Colonel, Colonel Breitenbach wanted to, to jump, to do a free fall jump with a square parachute. Now, a square parachute is the parafoil, so it's more like a wing, it's not like a pumpkin. So it, it flies like that, not like this. So the, there was a, a, a guy from Foreki who joined us. I think I can name him, Andre Kluter. He, he, in 1985, 
uh, he joined the South African uh, skydiving team. And they went to uh, Brazil, I think, for the World Championships. So they won both the A-team and the four-team um, on the World Champions. So they was very popular. And then he came, he worked for us then. So Andre was sort of the, the master jumper or trainer or instructor. You know, before, even if you haven't jumped, if you jumped a long time ago, you have to do some quick retraining and, and stuff like that. So Andre came, or the colonel came to Andre and says, So son, sergeant, I want to jump with a square. You must teach me. He says, I've never jumped with a square in my life. So um, Andre, about two days before the jump, he would tell the colonel, this is how it works and this is how you go. And they agreed, okay, Andre will go out with him. But then Mrs. Breitenbach, we call them as B, she, she sort of realized something is going on here, you know, and the colonel wouldn't tell her. And she said, Jan, Jan, or she called him Jan Dirk. Young Dad, you better not jump from a parachute. You are too old. And she said, oh, yeah, no, I'm just looking. I'm just looking and seeing what they're doing. And the day when we jumped, uh, she, there was a, quite a lot of uh, uh, guests there. I know for a fact, um, Colonel Eddie for you, you know, was there and his artist in Pit North yeah, etc. But and here's the colonel with his um square. Uh Lisa Ratman jumped with us. So first we went out with the static lines and uh, then they went up higher to about 10, 15, thousand feet. And they exited. So by the time I landed, me and Les and everyone, Mrs. B came to me and says, Steve, did you see my husband? I said, no, Mrs. B. I hope you're not lying. I hope he's not in the air, in that aircraft. <laughs> and the next moment, here comes the colonel on the did a perfect landing right there by the, the tent. Young Dad, I told you. <laughs> so he was, that is a, uh, I, I, I think Les took a picture of that and I'll, I'll send it to you. I can tell you, I find this quite enjoyable. If you think of Colonel Breitendor, you know, for us normal people, we don't actually know the man. It is sort of a, another way of thinking about him as a family man and uh, a caring wife who actually <laughs> said to him, listen, you're too old, too old, good job. But I have to say, she's got a point, you know, you know those, those square rigs are extremely maneuverable uh, in relation to a uh, pompoon. So if you, yes. you can really sweep slot yourself to Debe into the ground if, you, if you're not careful, but you can flare with it as far as I know. Anyway, yes, yes. Yeah, there weren't any accidents or anything. I mean, it's quite warm, you know, and winds and things in, in that area. So yes. I suppose it was safe. Yeah, it was only the river by the side, but um, no, we we never, never ever had incidents. In fact, I, uh, with, in my base in Kasinga, Fort Kasinga, we had a, the jumping tower, or what we call the Arpkas. Uh, uh, the Navy built it for us there. And uh, I had a, a chef. Uh, if you can remember the chef, I went to Angola to get with Dave Ruiz. 
and the chef's name was Danny. So Danny, Colonel, the Colonel loved him a lot, and he would later became my base driver. And I think when we had a parachute course there, he came to me and he said, Tenente, Tenente, I want to jump. I said, Danny, you are a chef. You can't jump. And he would sit on me the whole time. And one day I said to, to Andre, can we just take this guy up to the Arpkas and let him do some exercise? And he did it perfectly. So with the next course, Danny was in the aircraft and he, he did his parachute. So I think he was the, the first parabat chef <laughs> in Unita. Well, Internet, we are here back now at uh, the end of this episode. There's definitely going to be more episodes. We're not done with this fellow. He's not going to run away from us. We're going to grab him. Um, I know there were a few problems with the sound to the Internet. You know, there's nothing we can do. Sadly, when ESCOM goes down, the power, uh, the towers goes with it. We've tried our best. We will edit it as well as we can. Uh, but uh, I don't want to hear some stupid comments. I'll ban you. You know the rules at Legacy. We, we don't have time for stupid people. All comments, guys, we're doing our best. And remember, there's, a, there's an open invitation to all of you. Come and speak to us. Don't go the route where you know your stories are, are going to die with you because they will, unless you speak to us. And don't think you are unimportant. It doesn't matter where you serve. Every single one of these officers who served in the elite units Every one of the guys says to me, Chris, get the message out there that everybody was important. So I can tell you, if, if uh, you need to add a parachuting chef, then surely our chefs could have done the same if we wanted them to do that. You're laughing at the background step, but do you agree with me? I mean, everybody was important. The people shouldn't think of themselves as, Man, I was just a troopy way. I, I, you know what, man? You, you did, you did good. You did good. Do you agree with that step, or, or is it not true? Totally, totally. Especially our national servicemen, and they, they know. Um, I think that the morale of those guys, especially after we withdraw, uh, I mean, you look at. All the people going back to Angola to visit all those battlegrounds. And, you know, it makes you brave. It makes you proud. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, we see it on Legacy too. I mean, look at all the views. Even when we suppressed like this, I can tell you now, there's no way we can have more than 2 million views in two years if, if people were not interested. And you will not be interested unless you're proud and you have uh, a feeling of belonging which I think is coming out here. So guys, girls, everybody out there, thank you for listening here. Um, until we meet again, God bless.